Hello and welcome to History Happened Everywhere. The verdict. This is our after show podcast where we look back at our previous episode, which was Uruguay. So if you haven't listened to that one, go back and have a listen or else there will be spoilers ahead. Paul, it says on my script, insert something stupid. <laughs> Under your name. <laughs> Can you just say something stupid? Say please? something hilariously Dursley-ish. That would be amazing. It would really just help. pop it in there. It would really help me with the editing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, 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 I'll say something throughout the show. You can then find it and shove it in. Find it and shove it in, Ryan. Good <laughs> advice all round. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's do it. Hello and welcome to History Happened Everywhere. I'm Ryan Weir. I'm one of the co-hosts of History Happened Everywhere. I'm here in the studio with the other co-host, Mr. Peter Goddard. Definitely the main co-host, I would have said. Well, it's, it's not what the I feedbacks mean, well, come I mean, in as. Well, I'm getting a lot of letters is all I'm saying. <laughs> letters? Well, yes, like <laughs> an airmail. Telegram. Some of them airmail. <laughs> oh yeah, and there's Paul Dursley. Hey Paul. <laughs> that wasn't enough clearly. I know he's like the right, uh, groundhog let's do it properly. He's, he's in his bunker and he's not coming out until <laughs> he gets properly introduced okay fair enough ladies and gentlemen the one <laughs> the one and only Mr. Paul Dursley the judge jury and executioner of the verdict good evening yay <laughs> there he is he pops his little nose out of his burrow <laughs> <laughs> I've got a point, actually. Um, <laughs> yeah. Are you co-hosts or joint hosts? Surely you're joint hosts. Oh, I don't know. What's I mean? What's the difference? Joint is two, and co is many. Oh, is that right? Okay, so we're co-hosts together, all three of us. Well, I'm not when... a host. I'm a guest. I feel like you're a host by now. I think he's a guest. Do you? Yeah. Hosts get paid. Guests don't. Oh well, then yeah, you're a guest. <laughs> well, in that case, I'm a guest, and so are you. <laughs> we I'm... are all guests on this show. If that's the if that's the definition. <laughs> Pete, why don't you tell us a little bit about your last episode? So, give us a one minute summary. The time period was 1776 to today, which is a free America. So, the signing of the Declaration of Independence to today. The subject was death, and the country was Uruguay. The, the way I presented it was I did five deaths. The first death was the death of the first European uh, visitor who was killed and eaten by the natives. The second death was a chap called Artigas who was uh, seen as the father of Uruguayan nationhood. He died in Paraguay and his bones were travelled all the way back to Uruguay and moved around quite a lot. The third death was the death of an entire people, the Chirua people. The fourth death was a famous Uruguayan writer that had either a very unlucky life, or if you believe Ryan, who was a very sinister man who killed everyone in his life. And the final death was the death of a chap called Dan Mitrioni, who was sent to Uruguay to teach people how to torture. Uh, and those were the five deaths telling the history of Uruguay in five mortalities. So that, Ryan, was the podcast on Uruguay. Last week's episode done Summarised nicely Nice one, son Now we're over to a young Dursley Who's gonna tell you what he thought of me He'll take you apart without any care He's the lovely Paul Dursley The lovely Paul Dursley Paul, just overall, what did you think? Like, was there anything that was new to you? Most of it Oh, really? Okay uh, well, and as you were saying, Uruguay is not one of those countries that is particularly noticeable on the world stage, especially, as you say, it's sandwiched between uh, Brazil and Argentina. It is very much squashed between much, much bigger and more well-known places, isn't it? I, I, I did know it was created as a buffer state. I didn't know that we created it or we had a, a, dip, a diplomat creating it who also created Belgium. Right. I think I, I think Uruguay is a much better example than Belgium. In fairness, only because they murdered all of the natives who might have had a different idea. That's true. You you raise a solid point about the fact that this isn't sort of mainstream history. Like all of these things were new bits of information, it seemed to me. Yeah, yeah. I, I I generally like the ones that are the more obscure 
obscure. Sorry, I, I'm I'm not denigrating Uruguay and other countries, but some some of the more countries that we don't hear about so often here with the with our uh, sort of uh, you know ex British Empire plus America centric world. Well, I think that's also reflected in the fact that I did have a, a good number of people on when I was asking people on Reddit and various other places to to help out. People were kind of keen to go. Yeah, to help have people understand their country because uh, who who talks about Uruguay in the UK particularly? Uh, one person wrote to us said you know, enjoyed the podcast, which I was uh, grateful for. Uh, did point out a couple of uh, issues, which we'll talk about later. But uh, it was really refreshing to have their country talked about by not Americans uh, with oh, brackets really? because they don't know what they're talking about. They said, oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> okay. but no, it was, they they were quite keen. They were just pleased that uh, they're someone's paying attention to them right which is fair enough that well i mean that's kind of our mo we discover things by random i mean it's not we're doing it in my choice <laughs> but uh yeah i mean that's that's kind of one of the benefits of history happened everywhere i guess we we could land on the smallest remotest island and find some interesting stories to tell from from there as has happened. Yeah, well, I think indeed. we've been borne out so far, haven't we? We've never gone and nothing happened here and it was awful. There's always something interesting, isn't there? So I'm I'm wondering, Paul, about the time period. You mentioned the time period was very long. And one of the difficulties I had was trying to I wasn't sure whether I had to convey all of the time period or if it was cheating to just choose five interesting years within the time period. And I opted to try and give people a sense of the whole of the development of Uruguay, but keeping it reasonably personal. I don't know how you felt about whether that was successful or not. It was. Um, I liked how you had the deaths uh, and you sort of tied them to major periods of the country's history or turmoil uh, etc i thought that actually was was a I, I use the word conceit but not in a nasty sense it was a very good conceit a way to hang the story together i like that yeah me too so 1776 to present so this was the american independence right 1776 yeah, free america i think we call it Seven, free america yeah, no, 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 no. 1783 wasn't it yeah you see this is what i was interested in there we wasn't went from enough... the signing of the declaration rather than necessarily the end of the victory of the war yeah you don't declare independence you're granted it you take it i believe if you listen to marcus garvey and such we better not go down this route <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think South America is probably, in this country, the continent where we sort of know the least about, about those country changes, because, you know, everywhere else we used to own most of it, so we sort of knew it. But South America, we only had British Guiana, and I suppose the Falkland Islands, if you include those. Ah, yes, this is this is the first thing. You said Uruguay was the second smallest country in South America? I did say that. Is Second to Suriname. Is that true? Well, I thought it was true um, because I what, said it. Uh, what, about, <laughs> what, what about French Guiana? What about the Falkland Islands? They're both smaller and both in South America. Oh, dear, Petey. I can feel your grade Are they slipping <laughs> down the charts. Now, are they on the continent um, of South America? Or are they it, on the landmass of South America? How are what? we defining South America? Well, we're defining South America as as continents are defined as the continent plus continental shelf. Yeah, oh, so I didn't include the shelf. Is, Brit is Britain in Europe or not? Well, <laughs> <laughs> there's a can of worms to open. <laughs> <laughs> he said that like there was a really straightforward answer, and it wasn't super. Is, it hasn't been four okay, years. Okay, <laughs> okay. Is Britain geographically part of the European continent? Well, you see, my problem here is that I, I have the answer that I feel I should give for geographical reasons, and I have the answer that I should give to maintain my fact about the second smallest <laughs> nation in South America, which is that no. Britain is its own continent. Yeah. Okay. Tell us, what, what other facts did he get wrong? <laughs> Fine. Uh, but he was right in terms of sovereign countries in South America, because then... That's what I meant. 
Uh, French Guiana and the Falkland Islands don't count because they're not sovereign countries. I, I'm I'm totally with you. The, the sovereign thing was the reason I did all those things. And oh, said of course, of course, of course, it was. was. It didn't mean to say that the Wikipedia page said it was the second smallest country. In- Now, another thing that, well, I, some, one A that I found quite shocking was that Ryan didn't know who Amigo Vespucci was. I still don't, really. I, I still oh, think it's a lie. newsflash. I've been talking to people on this, and actually, it is not common knowledge by it's any not. means. No. No, because it wasn't him. It was Richard, <laughs> it was Richard Americ. Was the name the person that America is named after? Oh, your grade is going to be so low this week. Because why would you name a continent after someone's first name? <laughs> I'm not sure that was the thing I leapt to in terms of the. So oh, oh I'm enjoying this way too much. <laughs> so no, do please carry on, Paul. <laughs> well, Richard Richard Americk was a a Bristol merchant. A, a, actually, he was of Welsh descent. And so I think from the in Welsh, A. Merrick means son of Merrick. And so he was Richard A. Merrick, and he became a very wealthy merchant. And he was one of the main sponsors for John Cabot, or Caboto, who was a Genoese, I think. Right. Uh, and he was sort of on a British-sponsored expedition to North America, uh, sort of landed landed around Newfoundland. When, when um, was this? Uh, this was just after Cristobal Colon. Who? Christopher Columbus. Oh, okay. I'll translate the Dursley yeah, into modern yeah. speak for you. <laughs> Thank you. So just after Columbus... Yeah, Cristobal Colon sounds like a disease, doesn't it? I've got Cristobal Colon. How come if Columbus got there first that he didn't call it, I don't know, like Columbia or something? Because he thought it was in India. It doesn't matter. He could have still named the place. Well, no, he thought he was in a place that already had a name, so he didn't feel the need to name it. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> and and so, supposedly, and, you know, really, yeah, there's not much information to confirm this, but just as there isn't much information to confirm that Amigo Vespucci did as well. But one of Americk's things was he did he said, Oh, I want nothing from this exhibition from this expedition, but you know, if you come across somewhere new, why don't you name it after me as I've given you all the money? Right. And they didn't call it Richard Land. Like John Uruguay Belgium Ponson. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. So these are two people, regardless of who it was, Amerigo Vespucci, which is a better name than Richard America. America. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you join the um, army, in which case it was a point you, you could have been Captain America. <laughs> but what, I am surprised that I don't know either of those people if America is named after them. How uh, can we know Columbus so well and yet not Richard Funnily enough, I'm America? not surprised that you don't know. Well, no, but I know it's, it's highly common. I, I mean, everyone knows Columbus because he discovered, in inverted commas, America. In but 1492. Yeah, he sailed the ocean blue, famously. Uh, but no, I, I don't know. I, I I thought it was reasonably common knowledge, but I have to concur with you, Ryan, that I, when I talked to a load of people after it, afterwards, having gone, do you know this? No, most people don't know that. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, I feel somewhat relieved. And also apparently I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so there's that as well, right? <laughs> uh, so who, who led the first expedition to circumnavigate the earth then? Oh, uh, Vasco da Gama. Gama. I feel bad. <laughs> Is, which one of us is right? Is he it Phileas was a, Fogg or Vasco da Farma? He was <laughs> Vasco da Gama, but that would no, it was uh, Ferdinand Magellan. Oh yeah, it was Magellan. Yeah, Magellan. It's obviously he it gave the he was a he was a, he got a scarlet fever actually, and they did. Kind of, yes, actually, the, he didn't the make it. Magento, did he? isn't it? He didn't make it all. <laughs> he didn't make it all the way. And um, what what were Columbus's? So we've all before? been we've all had that experience. <laughs> what was that, Paul? What what were Columbus's three ships named? I know this one: Santa Maria, yes, the Santa Pinto, Clarita, no, Nino the Nina, Pinto? the Pinta, and the Santa Maria Pinta. Sorry, I had the male versions. Yeah, I got one. I get. Do I get a point? 
Can I have a point? Has this turned into a pub Just give quiz? me a point. <laughs> no, no, it's, no, 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 sorry. I've, I've, I've hijacked you. This has turned into a pub quiz. Let's... No, uh, let's... that's fine. That's fine. I like a pub quiz. I like a pub quiz too. I just like a pub. We can't go in pubs. Oh, pub, yes. So. Yeah. I would like to go to a pub, yeah. I want to ask you a question, Mr. Paul Dursley. Yep. Um, let's say you die. Which I will. Let's what, say that. Let's, let's just say have it. Have that thought for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> After that <laughs> rampant criticism I endured. <laughs> let's enjoy that thought for oh, a moment. Oh, <laughs> no, let's not. Um, how do you feel about me interring your bones in a museum? Don't care. I'll be dead. Oh, really? Okay. I thought you'd be more upset about that. Well, I'll be dead, so I can't be upset about anything. What if I constructed your bones into a basic but hilarious mannequin mm. and put on puppet shows daily of Paul Dursley <laughs> doing the verdict? <laughs> oh, what? Like that German chap who peels the skin off people? Oh, yeah. Uh, Body World. Body World. Yeah. Body World. Yeah. Would you have that done? Would you be okay if I plasticized your, your body? Uh, well, I... <laughs> I wouldn't specifically say do it, but if you did it, there's not much I could do about it. Okay. If you were to be plasticised, though, what pose would you request? <laughs> yeah, I think I would be the pose now, sitting in a chair with a yeah. brandy glass and a cigar. Yeah, I think that's how I would I'd have him. I wouldn't. <laughs> that's not how I'd have him. I'd have him juggling on a unicycle. Of course you as would. As he was known. <laughs> he died as he lived, <laughs> juggling on a unicycle. <laughs> <laughs> Listening to K-pop. <laughs> um, it reminded me of a story that I heard somewhat recently um, about the Irish giant. What, Finn Mac something or other? Charles Byrne. Oh, so totally different. Yeah. Um, so he, we're not talking a legendary giant, we're talking an actual human being. Oh, no, this was a, a, a genuine person who had gigantism. Right. Um, I think he was seven foot seven. It was tall, so he was I guess. Quite, for... quite a bit shorter than Robert Pershing Wadlow then. Yes, that's true. But I guess it's seventeen hundreds he was living. Still stood out, oh. I would imagine. So stood out, yeah. So this this he would have definitely stood out then and I guess would have become legendary. Um and he joined the oh, not a circus, but you know, came to London to sort of find weren't fortune. That, weren't his bones at the Hunterian Museum and yes. they'd only recently been repatriated. That's right. And that was why I it, have seen them. Ah, okay, right. So this is what it reminded me of. He his his last wishes before he died. He asked his friends to to. He said, "I want to be buried in a lead coffin and dropped at sea, so that nobody could get my bones and put them on display anywhere as a, a sign of you know how freakish I was." And specifically, I don't want Paul Dursley glaring, glaring at my bones at my remains. sometime in the unknown yeah, future. Yeah, he he just didn't want them, and so you know because I guess grave diggers at the time were was a problem. Uh, his friends intended on doing it, but before they could get there, somebody stole his bones, and there, there they are now in the museum, brought to London and and put in the case. I thought they were sent me feel back. Horrible. Well, they have I, now. Yeah, but but it was um, very very recent. Yeah, no, absolutely very recent. But how and awful it, is that? On the plus side of the giant, you could have picked him out of a bone box real easy. <laughs> <laughs> how big was your giant? <laughs> the bone box. <laughs> Good old bone box. That um. That is a really good tip. If you want to come to London and do something that's totally weird, go to the Hunterian Museum. Go on, well, t- tell us about it. What? What? It's the um, it's the well, Royal it's, College of Surgeons, isn't it? It's in, it's 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 sort of the House Museum of the Royal College of Surgeons, and you, uh, you have to sign in to go in, but any any anybody can go in, and. Yes, it is grotesque and really quite disgusting. He said with but relish. But also sci- <laughs> it's scientific as well. It's like there's lots of deformed fetuses in jars and I see. You know, deformed bodies and then the instruments that they used to use as well, which themselves are horrible. Oh, that comes up to a point that Pete raised, was it? Was it? I was with him on John Merrick. I thought it was John Merrick. Yes, my subsequent reading uh, revealed that yeah. John Merrick's name was not John Merrick; it's Joseph Merrick. Yeah, absolutely. I had to check it. Who who are we thinking of then? Who's John Merrick? 
It's just, wasn't he the it's racing just a guy? common mistake that's made. That's... No, John Merrick. Wasn't John Merrick the, the guy who did racing? He was like a... <laughs> John McCreary. Oh, John McCreary. <laughs> okay. So in the UK, there is a, a, a there's horse racing, and there was a famous extravagant guy, oh, highly deformed, highly deformed <laughs> guy. <laughs> okay, it turns out he wasn't John Merrick. He was John McCreary. McCreary. Yeah, I got that wrong. And Joseph Sorry. Merrick was the elephant. Uh, you enjoying yourself there, Paul? I'm enjoying myself a lot. <laughs> Good. I'm pleased. Sorry. All right, well, so we've agreed. We're going to plasticize your body. Yes, okay. Uh, that's based on true story. Pete, you mentioned earlier uh, that we've had some feedback. We have. From listeners. We have. They very kindly listened, uh, Uruguayan peoples, mm-hmm. and came back with some thoughts. Okay. So why don't you tell us what those thoughts were? So the first was actually quite, an, it's more of a discussion piece, really, because uh, they, so we, we talked about gauchos, mm-hmm. and, and I described them as cowboys. Uh, you did, yeah. And, and uh, this one chap, uh, a guy called Playful Currency on Reddit, said oh, i'd never really thought of them as cowboys he didn't say it was wrong he was just like, oh, i'd never really thought of them in that way they're kind of i guess they're a bit more nomadic than just cowboys are specifically kind of moving cows from a to b but okay. i think the gaucho is a bit more of a general general uh lifestyle thing of a no, of a nomadic person oh okay um, but he also wanted to point out that Frey Bentos no longer produces meat from Frey Bentos, the town so the town is still there yeah. but the uh site no longer produces the meat uh, we did a little history bites actually for those people who are on Instagram or Twitter uh, about the whole Frey Bentos thing, uh, in which we clarify that. But I didn't at the time say that they don't actually make corned beef or tin pies in Frey Bentos anymore. But they do make them. You can buy Frey Bentos. Yes, but not in the supermarket that I stopped in on on the way here because I really wanted to bring you a pie today. It's in the UK. I, I'm pretty sure it's owned by someone in the UK. I'm going to look it up. Well, um, I think Frey Bentos started off as a British company. Frey Bentos, I think, well, from Spanish, it means, is it Father Bentos? Frey as in, you know, a Catholic monk, Father Bentos. That's really interesting because I'd not considered that it actually meant anything. But yeah, it probably does, right? I think it's more brother than father. Uh, I, I, can't think, I think the company was called something like Liebig's Meat Extract or something. Yeah. Although it sounded German, it was a it was a British company, and they set up there. If you pour Diet Coke in a can of Frey Bentos, does it foam up and go everywhere, like in a packet of Mentos? So Frey Mentos is an entirely different product you're thinking of. That mint beef <laughs> combo that was uh, un- unsurprisingly unsuccessful. <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm absolutely <laughs> flummoxed. Uh, there is an online viral video sensation of people putting mento sweets into a giant bottle of diet coke and it there's some sort of chemical reaction where the mentos fizz up and it goes absolutely crazy and shoots like 20 foot in the air what's some sort of chemical direction it means it just gets the carbon dioxide out didn't you do that at school uh well we didn't do the mentos challenge no some people try and drink it they put the mentos in and then try and drink it and it just shoots Diet Coke in down their throat. <laughs> they get what they deserve. Other other beverages are available. Uh, Frey Bentos is now owned in the UK by Baxter's, which manufactures the product range in Scotland. Yet the Campbell Soup Company manufactures and sells Frey Bentos branded steak and kidney pies in Australia. I have to give you another correction that I got. Please do some more feedback. Uh, a, a lovely chap called to or chap or chap s called Tulio fifty eight also read it. Uh, first point complimented the podcast with the phrase and i quote quite enjoyable quite enjoyable quite enjoyable we should put that on the fly glowing praise there <laughs> so, somebody to my own heart yes. yeah it could be if that was a dursley type person that's pretty much the highest praise gets so uh they do say they found one important mistake right which is i said that fructuoso rivera was one of the 33 orientals so they were people who rode out of buenos aires stir things up in Montevideo against the Portuguese and Brazilians. Yeah. In fact, no, Fructuoso Rivera was not one of the 33 Orientals. 
In fact, he joined the Brazilian army after the invasion, so he was sent to fight against the 33. He was then captured, and then he changes sides and joins the uprising. So this is quite important, because I guess one of the reasons he's quite controversial to this day is that there's kind of two versions of peop- of this guy. Yeah, People who like him say, ah, he was just going to swap sides all along, and he was a like four-dimensional chess kind of thing. Yep. And other people say he was just a jerk who would switch sides at the drop of a hat to be on the winning team. This is the guy who had get out while you can plan. Yes. I mean, I'm on the jerk side, side of it just for that part of it. Yeah. It's, 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 it's sort of, that's incredibly ironic, isn't it? You know, name, na- name fructosa, sort of sweet, anything but utterly bitter. Yeah. Dreadful man. So yeah, I'm, I'm on the bitter, side of he's just a joke who changing sides to suit his own... Uh, purposes but apparently that that's one of the reasons he's so controversial because he actually wasn't one of the 33 he fought them then joined them and then uh became the first president so thank you tulio for picking that up on us yeah absolutely uh talking of death I want to talk about my favourite potential murderer. He was ah, clearly a yes. murderer. What was his name again? Uh, his name was Quir- Quiroga. Quiroga, that's right. And he was an author. He was. And I understand that you said that you were going to read one of his books. Yes. And then I backtracked a little bit and said I'd read one of his short stories. <laughs> 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 and then, incredibly, the, the the short story I found that uh, not I found I, I talked about was the feather pillow, which is one of his kind okay. of breakout stories. What's it about? Uh, and it is it is indeed very short. So I highly recommend everyone read this. Yeah, uh, it's called the feather the feather pillow. Does it involve him putting the feather pillow over someone's face yeah, and until the, they die? And, and they name that person, and it's somehow <laughs> he still never gets caught. No. The pillow over the face and shot them in the head. So no, I read the feather pillow. It is a creepy story. That's okay. uh, absolutely correct. Uh, I, I don't know if I... Should, I, I kind of Did want people to read it, in, but... Uh, spoilers. Okay. Spoilers, uh, if you're going to read it, which it only takes 20 minutes, it's a very short story. Uh, I don't do think not you can listen. spoil a story, a short story that was written however many hundreds of years ago. Of course you can, if they haven't read it yet, right? All right. So if you don't want to know what happens in The Feather Pillow, do not listen to the next two minutes. So in The Feather Pillow, uh, a woman has married her sweetheart. Uh, she is lying in she she goes to bed every night as one does yeah. uh, and she falls ill in a mysterious manner uh, and she gets weaker and sicker and more pallid and uh, eventually uh, and they find these two little prick marks on her head I think it is uh, was he biting her well I thought it was like it's vampire. going vampire way right I'm like there's a vampire uh, and eventually she dies yeah. and uh, then <laughs> when they after her death they cut open her it pillow and living in her pillow is this creature that has been draining her blood <laughs> on a nightly basis. It's been living in her Making her pillow. weaker and weaker until she dies. <laughs> Last time, no people like that at work. <laughs> and then the thing that really disturbed me was, uh, there was comments in the, the site that I read this story in, and one of them was like, I like a feather pillow, and now that's all I'll think of when one of the little feathers comes up and pricks me. Oh, yeah, they do and that. And then I thought, that, oh, I can be... never use a feather pillow again. That, that must horrifying. be where he got the idea. Right? right? Yeah, and then I was be. like, I was all creeped out by that. So now it was a good story. It's very short. That's a very good story. It's sort of, yeah, it, as it was... you said, Edgar Allan Poe, isn't it? That sort of... Talking of egg, I'm going to add it as an Easter egg at the end of this episode. I'm going to read it. Oh, yeah, I'll cool. put it as an audiobook. Surely it's not in copyright. You'd right? hope not, wouldn't you? All right, well, I'm going to read it. I'll oh, put that's it awesome. End. There you go. Yeah, it's a great story. Audiobook so coming. Don't, don't listen to that stuff we just said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, Pete, was there anything else from any of our listeners? Well, just another bit from Tulio, actually, which was that uh, apparently the people who moved... Do you remember Artagas' bones were moved from place to place? Yes. And he ended up in a mausoleum. So apparently it was the military regime that moved the bones to the mausoleum as a kind of nationalist pomp and ceremony kind of moment. And there's a, a kind of an urban legend that says the regime tried to engrave the walls of the mausoleum with some quotes from Artagas. But basically, they couldn't find a quote that didn't basically argue against their own tyranny and abuse of power. So they ended up putting dates instead. (laughs) Dates? Yeah, because they were going to do Artigas quotes. But basically, every Artigas quote was, you shouldn't be a horrible military regime. So they're like, 
Uh, let's just put when he lived then. No, that's that. great. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> that's a good fact. That's an awesome little postscript. Isn't that was U uh, Tulio, was it? That was our user Tulio. Exactly, Tulio fifty eight. Oh, Tulio fifty eight. There's to a lot distinguish of them. him from all the it's many other Tulios out there. Yeah. All right, I think it's that time. How do you feel? Are you ready? I'm ready to take. I'm ready to accept my judgment. I was happy with what I did. It was hard work to make a whole era occur and liven it up and make it individual. Liven it up. Or death, death it up, I suppose. <laughs> Deathen it up. Is that a thing? Yeah. No. Look, I mean, I, I like. I mean, I feel like we've been a little bit picky on you actually on this one. Um, but I, I really enjoyed the last episode. There was a lot of really interesting stuff. All right, let's do it. Let's hit the jingle. He's the judge, he's the judge, judging all of the things we does. He's the judge, 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 his name's Paul Dursley. All rise for the judge. judge he's the judge, 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 judge. judge, judge. judge. His name's Paul Dursley. Well, that's not very good grammar. How, how um... <laughs> <laughs> how are you, uh, how are you feeling about that sting? That's a new one. I feel like it's I an appropriate it. intro. I introduced that last week and I thought it was suitably awful. See, what I think lyrically it does is it makes it very clear that you're the judge and that you Clearly. judge the things we does. Yeah. And you're the judge. And then cleverly it rhymes judge with judge yeah. on five separate occasions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I think it's quite brilliant. That's what I was going for. I was going for something that was quite deep. I mean, nothing meaningful. rhymes more with judge than judge again. Again, several twice. times. <laughs> Judge and does as well. <laughs> anyway, I've had comments said uh, from people that they've been singing it in their heads. It's been going round around their heads now. <laughs> God, that is not high praise. I think that's a great. That means it works. Ah, uh, yeah, but it works in the same way as cyanide works, doing the thing it's supposed to. do. All right, Paul. Do you want me to make you another sting? I can make another one for you. Well, or are you happy uh, for us to use this one? I don't really have any say in it, do I? No, you don't. I think it's a dignified song for a dignified person. <laughs> <laughs> let's move on. All right, let's move on. Paul, you've 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 told us what your thoughts were. You've heard the thoughts of the the public, our our listeners. You've heard my thoughts. Pete has had a chance to you know offer his side of the story. That's fine, but they're all irrelevant. Right. What's the relevancy? Well, here. I would. When I'm in court, Ryan, I do not want you representing me I in would any way. Good lawyer. <laughs> so, jury guys, <laughs> here's the innocent dude. <laughs> so, come on then, let's do it. Give him the grade. Have you got your fingers in your ears? It would have been an A minus. I apart, don't know why you keep getting A's. I breached so much. Apart from the glaring person who wasn't in the time frame. I strayed, yeah, so I strayed and I have to it pay has the price. To be, it has to be demoted to a B plus. Oh, that's, that's almost an good. A. You might as well just give him an A. Give me, I might just put right A plus, Ryan. Just put, he said A plus. More Why right. do you keep getting A's? <laughs> <laughs> I told you last week. I don't agree. Nobody agrees with that, by the way. There was a lot of <laughs> criticism and anger. It, 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 there was a furora, an online furora about the fact that you um, said. I don't know what your. I don't know what a furora is. Is that like a furore? Yes. <laughs> yes. Ryan had to calm people down. Pitchforks were being purchased at an unprecedented rate. This isn't, and that's not a joke. People genuinely were really annoyed with. They thought that that was a, an injustice. They thought it was a really good episode and it should have got better than a B minus. Okay, don't judgment. these people have anything else to do? No, no. they don't. <laughs> they love, They're like they us. Love... <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, a B plus. He's the judge, he's the judge, judging all of the things we does. He's the judge, 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 judge. His name's Paul Dursley. All rise for the judge. Now oh, shut up. I'm looking at the grades now, right? <laughs> Pete. <laughs> P A's, to A A B plus. I've never B. given an A. I've never given an A. A no. minus. You gave a B. You gave an A. I'm telling you, you did A minus for body and mind yes, in Kiribati. But I never gave an A. 
Oh, it's still grade A. See, the, the problem you're the, the difference here, Ryan, is that uh, you keep entertaining people, which isn't what Paul Dursley is about. <laughs> <laughs> Your episodes are entertaining first and educational second, whereas mine are tedious but factually correct. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly. Write in and let us know if you agree. I fundamentally disagree, as we've discussed. The next episode is me, and it's East Timor in the classical era, 600 BC. <laughs> To AD 476. I mean, it conjures so many thoughts, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's the, Such as, where is it? The research is going really well. <laughs> I can tell you that. Now, it's going to be an interesting one next week. Um, Paul, you're interested? You, you ready to hear it or just not want to bother, given it's me? Do you just want to <laughs> skip next week and and wait for Pete's next no, brilliant I'll, one? I'll, I, I'm quite happy to give you a chance to shoot yourself in the foot. Yeah. Do you want to just pre-record, I'll give you a C now, and then you don't even have to listen? <laughs> yeah, no verdict. So, <laughs> <just> C! <laughs> <laughs> the shortest verdict in it. Hey, Brian, how's it going? Yeah, I'm fine. How are you, Pete? Yeah, I'm fine. Right. Well, Dursley, it's a C! The end. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's our show for this week. So thank you for listening. Um, if you'd like to get in touch about any of the things that we've discussed, uh, you can do that via our Twitter account, which is at HHE Podcast. Or you can email us at hhepodcast at gmail.com. And you never know, you might just end up featured on one of our future shows. Now, one way to definitely feature on a future episode is to rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts. It goes a little something like this. Five stars, hilarious podcast. It makes me laugh my head off and teaches me stuff, says Hannah the Bean from the United Kingdom. Hannah the Bean. So uh, if you want to be read out, uh, or if you don't want to be read out, you can tell us you don't want to, but just do review and rate the show on Apple Podcasts or your podcast provider. It does help us. helps other people discover the show as well. Uh, in the meantime, you can join discussions about the show on Facebook and Reddit, uh, or be sure to subscribe to them or come to Twitter, Instagram and LinkedIn, where a hit of History Happened Everywhere will magically appear in your feed every single day. Yeah, and every three days, we now have History Happened Everywhere Bites, which are short 30-second videos, which will appear again in all of those social media areas, and you can see those. And those are just like a, a little bit extra of Uruguay or whatever the latest episode is, just another fact or two. Yeah, things we couldn't fit into the podcast often. Or things you thought about too late. <laughs> or things we thought about too late, that's right. Okay, we'll be back again next week with a new place, a new time, and a new topic. And if that's not enough, we have a growing archive of old shows which you can access, download, listen to them whenever you want. They're available on YouTube, your podcast provider, or if you just want to go to hhepodcast.com. That's right. So, Paul, thank you very much for joining us. And thank you for having me. You're a lovely man. No, I'm not. A lovely <laughs> face, a lovely Dursley face. And all that's left to say is, you've been listening to History Happened Everywhere. The Verdict. I, I had to stop cooking my dinner for this. <laughs> what were you cooking? Chili, it would have beeped halfway through. Oh. I I never eat chili on the day I make it. I always cook it, then let it get cold and have it the next day. Like well hung meat. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> so they say about pheasants you're supposed to hang it until the first maggot drops to the floor. Do they? They do say Yes. That. What and then it's I mean I think that sounds absolutely Foul. Oh, <laughs> I was going to say foul. foul. I know I could have then. I thought, no, that's a cheap pun. Don't it's, do it, Peter. Um, 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 come on, that. pheasant isn't foul. Is it not? It's I thought game. foul just meant birds. It's game. The foul are aquatic birds, aren't they? Or waterfowl are aquatic. Yeah, idiot. What a land. <laughs> <laughs> I thought foul were birds. I thought it was just a generic term for birds. I don't think it covers um, game birds. Oh. Okay, so it just counts as game. The same as That's, a deer. 
Yes, I, th- I, th- I think it actually is, yes. Huh. It's- pheasant is a deer, Ryan, basically. Pheasant is a deer. Yeah, yeah, the same thing. I love this podcast because I learn so much stuff. <laughs> well, and the thing I is, know. I don't know if you're messing with me anymore because I'm going to say this to some uh, at some point and they're going to look at me like I'm an absolute fool. You know a you pheasant's know, for a hundreds deer, of right? Years, for hundreds of years, the Catholic Church said a rabbit was a fish. Okay, why? why? That's so you can eat it on a Friday. Exactly. The Feather Pillow by Horatio Caroga. Alicia's entire honeymoon gave her hot and cold shivers. A blonde, angelic and timid young girl, the childish fancies she had dreamed about being a bride had been chilled by her husband's rough character. She loved him very much, nonetheless, although sometimes she gave a light shudder when, as they returned home through the streets together at night, she cast a furtive glance at the impressive stature of her Jordan, who had been silent for an hour. He, for his part, loved her profoundly, but never let it be seen. Three months they had been married in April, they lived in a special kind of bliss. Doubtless she would have wished less severity in the rigorous sky of love, more expansive and less cautious tenderness, but her husband's impassive manner always restrained her. The house in which they lived influenced her chills and shuddering to no small degree, the whiteness of the silent patio, friezes, columns, and marble statues produced the wintry impression of an enchanted palace. Inside the glacial brilliance of stucco, the completely bare walls affirmed the sensation of unpleasant coldness. As one crossed from one room to another, the echo of his steps reverberated throughout the house, as if long abandonment had sensitized its resonance. Alicia passed the autumn in this strange love-nest. She had determined, however, to cast a veil over her former dreams and live like a sleeping beauty in the hostile house, trying not to think about anything until her husband arrived each evening. It is not strange that she grew thin. She had a light attack of influenza that dragged on insidiously for days and days. After that, Alicia's health never returned. Finally, one afternoon she was able to go into the garden, supported on her husband's arm. She looked around listlessly. Suddenly Jordan, with a deep tenderness, ran his hand very slowly over her head, and Alicia instantly burst into sobs, throwing her arms around his neck. For a long time she cried out all the fears she had kept silent, redoubling her weeping at Jordan's slightest caress. Then her sobs subsided, and she stood a long while, her face hidden in the hollow of his neck, not moving or speaking a word. This was the last day Alicia was well enough to be up. On the following day she awakened, feeling faint. Jordan's doctor examined her with minute attention, prescribing calm and absolute rest. "'I don't know,' he said to Jordan at the street door. "'She has a great weakness that I am... Unable to explain, and with no vomiting, nothing. If she wakes tomorrow, as she did today, call me at once. When she awakened the following day, Alicia was worse. There was a consultation. It was agreed there was an anemia of incredible progression, completely inexplicable. Alicia had no more fainting spells, but she was visibly moving toward death. The lights were lighted all day long in her bedroom, 
and there was complete silence. Hours went by without the slightest sound. Alicia dozed. Jordan virtually lived in the drawing room, which was also always lighted. With tireless persistence, he paced ceaselessly from one end of the room to the other. The carpet swallowed his steps. At times, he entered the bedroom and continued his silent pacing back and forth alongside the bed, stopping for an instant at each end to regard his wife. Suddenly, Alicia began to have hallucinations. Vague images, at first seeming to float in the air, then descending to floor level. Her eyes excessively wide, she stared continuously at the carpet on either side of the head of her bed. One night, she suddenly focused on one spot. Then she opened her mouth to scream, and pearls of sweat suddenly beaded her nose and lips. Jordan! Jordan! She clamoured, rigid with fright, still staring at the carpet. Jordan ran to the bedroom, and when she saw him appear, Alicia screamed with terror. It's I, Alicia! It's I! Alicia looked at him, confusedly. She looked at the carpet. She looked at him once again, and after a long moment of stupefied confrontation, she regained her senses. She smiled and took her husband's hand in hers, caressing it, trembling for half an hour. Among her most persistent hallucinations was that of an anthropod poised on his fingertips on the carpet, staring at her. The doctors returned, but to no avail. They saw before them a diminishing life, a life bleeding away day by day, hour by hour, absolutely without their knowing why. During their last consultation, Alicia lay in a stupor while they took her pulse, passing her inert wrist from one to another. They observed her a long time in silence, and then moved into the dining room. The discouraged chief physician shrugged his shoulders. It is an inexplicable case. There is little that we can do. Well, that's my last hope, Jordan groaned, and he staggered blindly against the table. Alicia's life was fading away in the sub-delirium of anemia, a delirium which grew worse through the evening hours, but which let up somewhat after dawn. The illness never worsened during the daytime, but each morning she awakened pale as death, almost in a swoon. It seemed only at night that her life drained out of her in new waves of blood. Always when she awakened she had the sensation of lying collapsed in the bed with a million pound weight on top of her. Following the third day of this relapse, she never left her bed again. She could scarcely move her head. She did not want her bed to be touched, not even to have her bed covers arranged. Her crepuscular terrors advanced now in the form of monsters that dragged themselves toward the bed and laboriously climbed upon the bedspread. Then she lost consciousness. The final two days she raved ceaselessly in a weak voice. The lights funerally illuminated the bedroom and drawing room. In the deathly silence of the house, the only sound was the monotonous delirium from the bedroom and the dull echoes of Jordan's eternal pacing. Finally, Alicia died. The servant, when she came in afterward to strip the now empty bed, stared wonderingly for a moment at the pillow. Sir, she called Jordan in a low voice, there are stains on the pillow that look like blood. Jordan approached rapidly and bent over the pillow. Truly, on the case, on both sides of the hollow left by Alicia's head, were two small, dark spots. They look like punches, the servant murmured after a moment of motionless observation. Hold it up to the light, Jordan told her. The servant raised the pillow, but immediately dropped it and stood staring at it, livid and trembling. 
Without knowing why, Jordan felt the hair rise on the back of his neck. What is it? he murmured in a hoarse voice. It, it's very heavy, the servant whispered, still trembling. Jordan picked it up. It was extraordinarily heavy. He carried it out of the room, and on the dining room table he ripped open the case and the ticking with a slash. The top feathers floated away, and the servant, her mouth opened wide, gave a scream of horror and covered her face with her clenched fists in the bottom of the pillowcase. Among the feathers, slowly moving its hairy legs, was a monstrous animal, a living, viscous boar. It was so swollen one could scarcely make out its mouth. Night after night since Alicia had taken to her bed, this abomination had stealthily applied its mouth, its proboscis, one might say, to the girl's temples, sucking her blood. The puncture was scarcely perceptible. The daily plumping of the pillow had doubtlessly at first impeded its progress, but as soon as the girl could no longer move, the suction became vertiginous. In five days, in five nights, the monster had drained Alicia's life away. These parasites of feathered creatures, diminutive in their habitual environment, reach enormous proportions under certain conditions. Human blood seems particularly favorable to them, and it is not rare to encounter them in feather pillows.